David, your new book, Panic, is, is a collection of essays from across your career. Why did you settle on the theme of panic to represent this collection? I'd never thought of it before until I was writing about the mad uproar over Bill Henson. And I realised that I've been writing about panics all my career. I'm fascinated by panics. I'm fascinated by false crises that are, that are beaten up for political purposes, usually. Beaten up. Um, are quite exhilarating for everybody to take part in. I mean, it's quite, it's really quite a thrilling business to be in the middle of a panic for everybody, of course, except the victims. And I'm very interested in the wreckage that's left behind. And I've had a whole career, really, which began with my first book, which was about 1975, a biography of Garfield Barwick, one of the perpetrators of the outrage of 1975. And that was the first great panic that I'd witnessed um, as a journalist, the panic over the Whitlam government. And I realised that these panics are there all through my career. And not just through your career, they, in fact, it's something interesting that you say in the introduction that Australia, looking back, has actually been afflicted by panics since, since the beginning of, of settlement. Uh, we, there was the panic about Chinese miners, Chinese labourers, then etc. communism. Mm. Mm. It's an interesting thesis. Why are panics part of Australian culture? Panic has shaped this country. I mean, Federation, one of the reasons that these fractious colonies decided to get together was to control the borders of the country in order to keep Chinese out. We were, we were shaped by a panic about Chinese a panic that by that stage went back 40 or 50 years to the gold mines and to the gold fields, but it was absolutely active at that time. The nature of the constitution we decided on was shaped by panic. We weren't going to have a Bill of Rights in our constitution because that bill would give rights to Chinese. And that's shaped the, the politics of this country for over a century since. And then then regularly pulsing through the political life of the country have been these waves of panic. Not just in wartime, though they've been spectacular in wartime, but in peace as well. Panics about wobblies and panics about reds and, and then the long-term panics that rise and fall about, about drugs and about um, dirty books and about Catholics and about poofters. And there they come and go, come and go. But the last kind of 10 or 15 years has been a particular time of these panics. And that's what I've concentrated on in the book. And do you call it the panic that never goes away? In some ways, the, the sort of the central or the formative uh, panic that we, our society has is the fear of being taken over from the north or by, by foreigners arriving. And in the past 10 years, it's obviously translated into this fear about asylum seekers. But it's odd because we live in the most protected developed nation in the world. Hmm. So how has it come to this? Why, why are we so scared? I think it, every nation has a notion of how it might be undone. And if you're Poland, you're worried always about armies from the east and armies from the west. Australia is not worried about a formal invasion. We're not worried about the Indonesian Navy or the Indian Navy, or absolutely not worried. But we are worried and have always been worried about being an isolated island at the far end of the earth with this enormous mass of people to our north who must surely envy us so much that they would wish to get in rowing boats and dinghies and trawlers and old ferries and come down here in massive numbers and simply overwhelm us. It's a primal fear of this country. It's the fear of being overwhelmed um, by, by tiny little boats carrying perhaps millions of people. And while that was sort of just a phantom in our minds, all was kind of under control. But in 1976, the first refugee boat arrived in Darwin Harbour, um, a little boat come all the way from Saigon with five people on board. And that was the first time the ditch had been crossed by refugees, unwanted, unassessed, unpicked, coming of their own accord. And that ignited a panic that had been there in a latent form for a very long time in this country. 
And that panic is the panic that never goes away. There's never actually really been evidence that it will become a flood. The trickle has become a larger trickle, but it's never become a flood in Australia. Why the excited sort of hyperventilated sense regarding this when is it the very fact that we're kind of acting out fears rather than that they're real fears? As in, is it the very sense, is it the very fact that it's contained that makes us act it out and, and hyperventilate? I think what gives the boat panic its particular resilience is that never, from the moment that first boat arrived in Darwin, never has a political leader in this country actually used political capital to ask people to calm down, to point out how difficult it is to get to this country, to point out the real figures, to point out how few people come here by boat. There's, there has been, in fact, um, a situation where nobody will speak well of boat people, refugees. No one will speak well for them in the very upper echelons of, of our politics. Both leaders of both sides have beaten up on boat people for 35 years and used where it suits their purposes um, claims that, you know, you may only be seeing a few hundred now, but the Great Flood is on, their way, is on its way. Philip Ruddock, memorably, um, during the third wave, we're in the fourth wave now, the third wave was the Tampa wave. During that third wave, Philip Ruddock was saying things like, whole villages in the Middle East are packing up now to come to Australia. Um, now, there was no evidence ever of this. And, and the pattern of these things is for the waves to come and go, come and go. Now, there's no doubt that, that Howard stopped the third wave and he stopped it by towing back, boats back to Indonesia, something that can no longer be done. The Indonesians weren't allowed to be done. But the pattern over 35 years are for the waves to come and go and come and go. And the fourth wave now, this year, 2011, Though you wouldn't know it from the political discourse, boats are arriving in Australia at exactly, exactly half the rate they arrived last year. So it may well be that this wave is washing through again. But the great fear of the huge flood is the fundamental, the fundamental fear that drives the politics of the boats. There was a lot made <clears throat> at, the, in, at the sort of beginning of the Howard years that he'd broken the bipartisan agreement that you don't talk about race in this way. But in some ways, when Labor joined him in agreeing to offshore processing, we still had a bipartisan agreement. We still have, in some respects, a bipartisan agreement in the way that the government and the opposition talk about this issue. Would, would you agree with that characterisation? I wouldn't quite call it a bipartisan agreement. I think it was bipartisan for the first 20 or so years, for the first, certainly for the first um, two waves. And in the second wave, after a terrifying year in which 216 people had come to this country by boat, by refugee boat, mandatory detention was instituted and that was a bipartisan agreement. And, but, but under Howard, the, the, the conservative parties in this country saw the tremendous political advantages that could be won by hammering Labor over this issue, a, a party deeply divided about how we should respond to refugees. And though the ultimate shape was kind of bipartisan, it was entirely forced by Howard. And now in the fourth wave, the Labor Party is being forced again, this time from the opposition by Tony Abbott. I wouldn't call it so much a bipartisan agreement as these are two brawlers who are somehow tied at the ankle and they have to go where the other goes and the tougher one is leading the race. Right now it's the opposition. You wrote a chapter in the book about Pauline Hanson. Do you look back at the, that the Hansonite moment as the moment that everything changed? Australian politics was transformed in the Hanson era because John Howard, with astonishing political deftness, had to deal with this woman. She was clawing votes out of the, out of the conservative camp. And though, you know, we look back on her now and think of her as a kind of almost comic moment in Australian politics, it was not. And the way Howard coped 
with and defeated Hansen was to adopt many of her policies. And he brought back into the ordinary domestic politics of Australia race in a way that it hadn't been there for 20, 30 years. And that was a transforming moment for Australia. And the willingness of the coalition parties to, to deal with race in order to win domestic political advantage transformed Australian politics. Now, we're not allowed to call it race. I mean, they, they fume and, and, and become extremely indignant when it's named for what it is. But this is the deliberate manipulation of the race fears of a section of the Australian um, electorate for the advantage of, of the coalition parties. And unfortunately, when the Conservatives head in that direction, Labor has followed. And there were accomplices in the sense that the media were very willing. There was the rise during this time also of the, the shock jock, the, the very strident conservative columnist and radio broadcaster. They, they would have, they have to be recognised as part of this shift as well, don't you think? Yes. And crucial to this operation, um, which in a sense is a kind of recruiting drive, recruiting the most fearful Australians to, to the conservative side of politics. Crucial to that effort has been the tabloid press, talkback radio, shock jocks, and the, that cohort of, of Tories who speak to the working class. Um, there's, a, there's, an old, um, there's an old axiom that the purpose of the tabloid press is to make the working class vote conservative. Um, and while all of those terms don't quite fit anymore and the language seems cr you know, clunky and outdated, it's actually true. So that, so that the shock jocks to make, to, to, to make us fearful, to make sections of the, of the community fearful, fearful about immigrants from the Middle East, fearful about refugees, fearful about the boats, have beaten up and have beaten this into a panic. And that panic has been um, of great benefit to the conservative side of politics. The, the panics, though, I, I don't want to mischaracterise the, the sort of breadth of this idea. It's not simply about asylum seekers. Can you talk a little bit about the, the other attendant minor panics, I guess you'd call them? I mean, you wrote about Bill Henson and the way, it, in some ways, that followed the perfect pattern of a panic, the way that something that had been there all along and was relatively minor and the, art, the arts were ignored by the mm. tabloid press. There was a moment of uh, this explosive moment when people realised that there were pic pictures of children. Why did the tabloids all of a sudden take an interest in this issue? One of the fascinating things about panic is that we forget them once they're passed. Um, and we look back and we say, hmm, what was all that about? And we sort of put them aside. It's very interesting polling figures about the Tampa panic. I mean, the Tampa panic was one of the great panics in the history of this country. And at the time it was roaring, something like it was 77% of Australians polled absolutely agreed with what Howard was doing. You know, blocking the boats, sending out the Navy, pushing boats back to Indonesia, stopping the Tampa, unloading its, those that had rescued from the sea. 70, 70% of Australians thought that that was fine supported it. Two years later, the same questions asked to Australians and supported fall on 35%. We'd taken another look at it, we'd calmed down and we'd seen it for what it was, a beat up. And that's the thing with panics. We forget they're there. We forget we have this history of panic because we're slightly ashamed of them and we just put them aside. The Henson panic is a perfect example of this. While it was on, it convulsed the nation. There was nothing more important in politics than getting that bastard Bill Henson for what he was doing to kiddies. But now it's kind of completely forgotten and we're somewhat really ashamed of it. But it was a classic panic because here was a conversation about Henson's work, a genuinely controversial conversation about the nature of his work that had been going on in the art world for 20 years. And on a particular day in Sydney, when it suited the domestic agenda in Sydney, it jumped the tracks and became a tabloid panic, helped by the internet, because suddenly there was the evidence 
of what, of what was being talked about, what was suddenly so fearful, pictures of naked children on not just an art gallery wall, but up on the internet. And the internet magnifies panic. We are, in fact, deeply fearful of the internet. We're fearful of what's coming down the track um, on the internet. And the Henson panic was blown up by the tabloid press, by the fear of the internet, by the politicians at the time who had, you know, access to grind with one another. And then it was joined by the Prime Minister who condemned those photographs. And at that point, as one of the characters in this book says, it became incendiary. I just wanted to talk a little bit about you as a writer and how you've approached these issues. It's interesting that you say you've only sort of come around to realising that you've been writing about panics for all these years, but it is something that you nevertheless have been writing. You have been drawn to these. How do you... You're a writer that's seen as, as sometimes carrying a, a political position. You, you represent a political position, in, certainly in the eyes of some in the tabloids. Do you see, how do you see your approach to these issues? What, what are you trying to do when you pull out and, and look at a topic like the Henson saga? The Henson saga was just, was just writing about it was just thrilling because it, was, it had something... Everything about it, um, you know, it was about the arts. I love writing about the arts. It was about the bad behavior of the press. That's been a big part of my career. Um, it was about um, the, the, absolute, um, the absolute sort of um, uh, nuts and bolts nastiness of politics, which is something that's always fascinated me as well. It all came together. But I've had, I realize, a lifelong skepticism about those Tory guardians of good behaviour, the Tory guardians of order, who are simultaneously beating up panics in order that we need them. I mean, without the panics, would we need these people? Well, no, we wouldn't, so we have the panics. And that's been part of my life for a long time. As I say in, the, in one of the essays in the book, um, you know, I grew up as a gay man. I grew up watching respectable citizens, commissioners of police, state premiers, um, uh, uh, cardinals, archbishops, beating up on people like me, keeping alive an old panic about pufters that had served them very well for a very long time. And a transforming part of modern Australia has been the death of two panics. One is the panic about Catholics and the, and the divide between Protestant and Catholic which was one of the nastiest, deforming characteristics of Australian society for a long time. And it just disappeared in the 1970s. It just disappeared. And the other panic that has essentially disappeared, though God knows there are warriors still trying to keep the damn thing alive, is the panic about homosexuals. That is over too. When panics disappear, society is changed. It's better. It's calmer. It's life is better, more fun. I'd argue that, the, that on the gay issue, that gay marriage is, is still a dormant issue, that it's actually still waiting there for someone to, to whip it up because we, we haven't, it, it's not, this is not a dead issue. It's still a live issue. Of course it is a live issue. Um, and gay marriage is, is the, next, the next battle um, that's being fought. And there are people trying to whip up a panic about gay marriage. And they're trying very, very hard. They're holding massive meetings in the Great Hall of Parliament. They've, they've got networks of um, you know, internet sites. They're raising money. They're campaigning. They are tramping the corridors of the National Parliament to make sure this doesn't happen. But at the same time, inexorably, the attitudes of the public are shifting in favour of gay marriage. A, even a few years ago, gay marriage was a minority notion and it was condemned by cardinals and archbishops as the willful, the willful pursuit of minority um, ideas by the gay, the gay lobby. But now it's a majority view. 65% of Australians are perfectly happy with gay marriage. They might find it a little incongruous, but you know, if two blokes want to marry, well, let them. And support for the absolute opposition to gay marriage, which is, of course, backed by the Labor Party and backed by the coalition parties, is down at about 30%. It's losing. 
But just because a panic is disappearing doesn't mean there won't be people deeply committed to whipping up that panic again, giving it a go. Speaking of people whipping up panic, what was your response to the recent Bolt free speech decision? I'm a campaigner for free speech and I have campaigned against the terms of anti-vilification legislation in this country because those, those um, acts on the whole set the bar much too low. They begin to engage with speech which merely offends or insults and the right to offend and insult is a crucial right in a, in a free society. But what Bolt was doing was something different. He was defaming people. He was viciously defaming people. And it is interesting to see that some of his most, most passionate defenders are saying two things simultaneously. That there is a great issue of free speech here that must be pursued. On the other hand, they would never have published those articles. And, there, and, and I don't see that you can build a great campaign for free speech on such a shaky foundation. Bolt was wrong. He wasn't wrong in a few details. You know, yes, he thought Larissa Barrett's father was German and he wasn't German. He wasn't a white German. He was actually a black Australian. Trivial, trivial, trivial mistake. Nine people he described as making a late life choice to identify as Aboriginal, either for career or political gain. Nine people had grown up identifying as Aboriginal since childhood. He put his boot into those. He was vicious about those people. He was disgusting about those people, and he was wrong. And the trial that he went through was not a trial that was designed to, to, to work out whether those nine had made such late life identifications. The trial began with Bolt's lawyers and the lawyers for the Herald Sun admitting they were wrong in each case. Now you cannot build a free speech campaign, a free speech debate on such completely shoddy foundations. If Bolt had got it right, and if Bolt were being punished merely for his language, I would be on the barricades with him. He got it wrong. And getting things right does matter. I've made mistakes in my life. I've made mistakes, and I hope I've corrected them all as a journalist. I wanted to ask you actually about, um, not so much about not directly the specific mistakes you've made, but about the role of a journalist as opposed to the role of uh, a commentator. Uh, where do you see yourself in your writing, given that you are, as you say, a campaigner? How, how do you sort of ride these tensions? Do, do, do you worry? Um, I don't worry because, because I think the difference is, look, I don't worry about that because what I do is lay out the facts on which my commentary is based. I think you can have vivid commentary, um, you know, um, angry commentary, dramatic commentary, so long as it is fairly based in fact. And that's what I think people want. They want strong views, but they want them clearly based in fact. So I go to an enormous amount of effort to show people exactly where all my material comes from, why I've come to the decisions I have, why I'm arguing as I do. And that will allow them to judge whether what I'm saying is fair. If it's not fair for them, well, put it aside. If it is fair and instructive, then I hope it'll engage their attention and perhaps change some minds. But I have nothing but contempt for commentary which is based on invention, on error and on lies. And there is a lot of it about in this country, a huge amount of it about. And I think that that's how, that's how panics are whipped up. That's how you do it. You can't, most panics can't survive fact. They can't survive fact. But when we're in the grip of the panic, we don't pay any attention to fact. I wanted to just work back to the asylum seeker issue as the kind of totemic issue of, of the panic that you talk of. Uh, the culture wars that really sort of kicked off under Howard were fueled by the intellectual uh, sort of fights between the left and the right uh, and 
they became uh, the and likewise the asylum seeker issue it exploded to some extent as a result of it being seen as a way that you could uh, you could uh, split the population between the the elites so-called and the not elites yes. how it's battlers do you ever wonder or worry about the the inflaming of this debate that it's that it is inflamed specifically because it's a way of fighting battles with the imaginary or the uh, the very real elite that that Howard and the right wing commentators uh, talked about. Those culture wars, those bloody culture wars. What a sterile diversion they were over now. But they had purposes. They had really clear purposes. And I think looking back. All that stuff about elites was code for people who took a decent moral view of the way in which public life should be conducted. And what Howard was trying to do, and did successfully for a long time, was overturn a decent consensus in this country, firstly about race, that we didn't use race in the way that Howard wanted to use race for his political advantage. That was one of the main ones. Another one was that we weren't to have moral objections to American um, foreign policy, because of course these were being fought out a lot of the time during, during the time of um, the invasion of Iraq. And these were condemned, you know, the decent notion that, that an unprovoked, an unprovoked um, invasion of another country um, uh, was just not on. This all had to be put aside. This was condemned as political correctness. It was condemned as, as the elites. Most of it was just about decent, ordinary, moral view of this community about what was good and bad for us, what was right and wrong for us. And the boats were another part of that. While there's always been this, this large constituency of fear in, these country, in this country about the boats, a very valuable political constituency, there's also been a large constituency, and indeed a larger constituency most of the time, for dealing decently with refugees who come here by boat. Now, the culture wars were about disarming the moral position of those people who said, let's behave decently here, let's behave decently on race, let's behave decently in our foreign policy. And that was labelled as elite, and quite successfully for a while. But boy, has that disappeared. When was the last time you heard the elites being condemned? It's over. That language is gone. What do you think is the future of the asylum seeker debate, uh, at, given the, the failure of the Malaysia solution? Do you think we're destined, uh, for example, to be continuing to fight, uh, to, to have these debates for, the, for another 10 years? I'm extremely pessimistic about the, where the asylum seeker issue goes from here, because the lockstep we've been talking about, in which both sides of politics walk, this lockstep, I can't see how it's broken. If at some point a political leader in this country could stand up and say, we've got to think about this to, we've got to think about this again to its very core. We've got to rethink this. We've got to, we've got to acknowledge that these people are not invaders. They are not interlopers. We've got to recognise them for who they are and the numbers in which they come. Unless that happens, I just can't see how you break this cycle of fear, fear whipped up into panic, of both sides of politics joining in the debate, or joining in these brawls to outdo one another in cruelty to refugees. I can't see how it ends. Um, yeah. I can't see where it goes. I've just got one final question. Uh, it, it's about the idea of panic and this thesis that you have that our nation is one that has fears that are easily roused. This really goes against the, our, our self-image of Australia as easygoing, laconic, self-reliant, sensible. Are we really so deluded? We're not the country we think we are. We're not larrikins. We're not self-reliant. We're not, you know, tremendously independent and thinking for ourselves on issues, etc., etc., etc. We respect authority. We love authority in this country. It's one of the reasons Australia is such a fantastic place to live, because it is orderly, peaceful, and we take the lead from our leaders. We don't necessarily like them, but we take our lead from them. 
And when our leaders start beating up on panic, we take it very seriously. Our scepticism dissolves. We take it much too seriously. And so these gusts of panic sweep through our politics in ways which in other countries there would be more of a tendency to laugh, to show disbelief, to turn your back on it and just get on with things. We, we fall into panic in a way that is particularly Australian. And then we recover from it and we forget about it and put it behind us. But the next panic is waiting and these panics coarsen our politics. They narrow our politics and they make us less than we might be in this country. It's a really terrific book. Uh, I enjoyed it a lot. Thanks very much for talking to us. Thank you.